All right, good morning. Mr. Preston. <laughs> oh, thank you. I don't think my name's on the ballot, is it? <laughs> Boy, I, I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Actually, I've had people over the years say, I wrote your name in. I thought, well, that's great. I'm not waiting for a call. <laughs> ah, oh, boy. I'd be, be glad when this is uh, through here. You know, then we can start the next campaign. Anyway, want to welcome you. Want to welcome anybody's visitors, you know. I thought with the... Uh, Time change, extra sleep and stuff. We get more people here, you know. <laughs> the same old crowd. There you go. Yeah, well, praise the Lord. Glad you're here. But we have a visitor's card on the back table. First time visitor, and uh, uh, glad that you're here this morning. And uh, of course, there are those who are following on YouTube. Uh, annual business meeting uh, next week. The booklets are on the back table. It was quite an effort. Yeah, right there you go. They're free. Welcome. So go over. Help you read through this and to take a look at the uh, uh, the budget and and so uh, I thought Adrian did a great job. So it's fantastic. You fixed. All right, so so we already have some corrections here and dendum. So anyway, one per family, pick those up and go through that. Uh, so next week it's going to be uh, a little bit different. We'll have our Thanksgiving potluck, okay, after the service, and then we'll have our business meeting up there. And it, it usually goes, oh, uh, well, less than an hour. We got three things to do at the business meeting. We have to receive the reports, we have to approve the budget, and then we, of course, elect, you know, nominations. If you're not a member, uh, but like to attend a business meeting, that's fine, you know, and so it's, uh, it's an open meeting. Um, so, so, that'll be, so that'll be next week uh, for, for the annual business meeting. Uh, if you're interested in being a member of the missions committee, just uh, let us know because uh, we have to reconstitute that committee. Uh, the uh, again, the book that's on the back table. That the 16th will be the holiday rummage sale. Uh, so buy all, bring all your rummage in, <laughs> and the tables are 10 by 10. You know, you know, one per each. Uh, you know, a member who'd like to be a part of that, that'd be great. Study in the book of James, the fourth chapter. This is one of the three spots in James that he does a summary statement and a conclusion to the matter. And so before he gets into his final instructions in the fifth chapter, One of the heights of arrogance is when we think we know everything. <laughs> think we know all the information we need, thinks we have confidence to move forward in our own plans, in our own ways, in our own wills and overcoming. Chuck Yeager gives an example in his book called Yeager. What, what else? What else would you call it, right? <laughs> of when they were making the F4, the F4 Phantom, and it kept having planes crashed in the testing and behind the farm, and about six of these planes. So they went back to the factory to find out. And in the factory, that one man. The instruction says that these bolts that lift the elevators on the wings had to go in upside down and they were left turned 
bolts. Well, he knew very well that you don't put in bolts upside down. So he turned them around and put them in right side up. And when they try to move the elevators, it would lock. Now, if you know anything about, you know, aviation, I, I did earn my Jaeger Award over here. Anyway, <laughs> those elevators are ones that are pitched to lift or to descend. If they lock in, that's where you're heading. Now, no one, according to Jaeger, told this man how many lives he had cost <laughs> and how many millions of dollars of equipment were destroyed because he refused to obey the instructions. But by gum, he knew better. <laughs> And we always think we know better. And so this is what James addresses here, that when we think that we have everything under control, when we think, I got this. Listen to what he says here in James chapter 4, verse 13. It says, come now you who say today or tomorrow, we'll go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. James had moved from topic to topic. He started out with those who lack wisdom, those who are double-minded, those who get carried away by their own lust, those who, you know, withhold um, help to those who have a need, those who show favoritism. He talked about the tongue. Now, he, he comes to a bottom line saying, you do all this in your arrogance and, and in your pride. And so, scriptures is rep replete with those who show willfulness. For example, when J Jacob tricked his father at the advice of his mother, Rebecca, to give him the blessing instead of Esau. Well, if God had appointed him to be over top of his brother, that he would be the one who would carry on the line of the promise, God would work that out. He did not need Jacob's help. The, the, the bottom line was Jacob was separated from mother, his mother the rest of his life because he had to go away because Esau was going to kill him. Joshua, in his, he's a good man, <laughs> but in his arrogance, say, you know what, uh, Jericho is a tough city and God had to help us, but oh, God, we don't need any help in this little city of Ai. He attacks Ai, gets defeated, 36 people die because there was sin in the camp. Jacob didn't check with the Lord. Later on, he didn't check with the Lord when it came to the Gibeonites. He didn't check with the Lord. Uh, David, ah, I've been out to battle so many times, I think I'll stay home. <laughs> Second Samuel chapter 11, it was time the kings did what? Got out to battle. And we know the whole Bathsheba, Uriah thing that happened. Paul was told by his disciples through the Spirit, it says, Acts 1, 21, 4, not to go to Jerusalem. But Paul wanted to what? He wanted to go to Jerusalem. And he made a mess of things, <laughs> including his own ministry. He spends two years in jail up in Caesarea. 
causes problems for his fellow disciples or apostles, uh, Peter and uh, James and those in Jerusalem. You know, no one has ever had a better idea than God. <laughs> Someone said, has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurred to God? <laughs> So James addresses here the businessmen. He says, they're very confident. They said, okay, we're going to go to such and such a city. We're going to spend about a year there. We're going to make uh, good money, transact business, and make a nice profit. We got this planned. Now the businessmen, he said, you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. You don't know what you're going to meet. You don't know what the challenges are going to be. You're not in control of your own destiny. We think that we know and that our plans are going to work out. And on top of this arrogance of assured planning, they're boasting what they were going to accomplish. They had it all figured out. We're going to make lots of money by doing this. We have a plan. Now, I want you to notice something. This is very uh, pivotal to the passage. It says, all such boasting is what? It's evil. You know, Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, and Jesus mentions in John 15, 5, that without him you can do nothing. We have nothing to boast of. As a matter of fact, we're told in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or whether you drink, whatever you do, what? To all to the glory of God. It's, it's all to his praise. It's not about me. It's not what I've accomplished. I cringe when I hear one of these... Uh, you know, famous radio preachers, celebrities, talk about what they have done. You know, I remember one time, you know, Steve invited me to a meeting at a church around the corner to listen to a head of a college. And then Steve said, and he was right, he said, you're not gonna get a message. He's gonna say, I did this, and I did this, and I accomplished this, and what did he say? It's me. I did this. I did that. And by the way, that college doesn't exist anymore. It's not about us. It's what the Lord has allowed us to do. It's what the Lord allows us to accomplish. It's not of us. And so he says, all such boasting is bad. In Paul's said, told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 10, if I boast, I'm going to boast, what? In the Lord. Because I haven't done anything. Now, by the way, let me side trip two chapters later. Paul was tempted because he said he was 2 Corinthians 12. He was lifted up in the third heaven. He saw his revelation. No one else was able to see. He said, but unless I be lifted up above my measure, God did what? He said, a thorn in his flesh. God has ways to remind us. Uh, I remember a testimony of, uh, what was her name, Everett Carroll? Uh, uh, Carol Everett, Carol Everett, Carol Everett. who was a Christian, but she ran two abortion clinics. <laughs> And she knew that she should go. She said, well, I'm not going to give up this business unless the Lord has been having a two by four. Then she says, I didn't know he had one. <laughs> and what happened was it got out that they were doing abortions on women that weren't even pregnant and taking their money. And they said all the news media showed up and she was ruined. And then she realized what her sin had been and what her sin was. And said, God has a two by four. <laughs> he really does. And when he sends Professor Thorne to your house, you'll know <laughs> that you're just a human being after all. Right? You're just flesh. 
nothing but dust unless God breathes into you and gives you the high privilege of being made after his image. And so, he says, all such boasting is evil. Nothing can be accomplished apart from what the Lord allows. And unless he receives a credit for it, unless we are interested in making sure that he's getting the praise, unless we are making sure that we are staying in the background, allowing him to work through us, it's evil. And so he gives, James gives advice to the haughty. James starts out with an undeniable truth. Life is but a vapor, a short appearance, and then a disappear. And the psalmist said that we're like the grass that grows up in the morning and in the evening is cut down. Life is very, very short. Very transient. And as a songwriter wrote, you know that we're just a passing through. <laughs> and so, you know, someone once said, and I think it's a good concept, that on every tombstone you have a beginning date and an end date. But what it really matters is a dash in the middle. <laughs> what do you do in between those days? And so Moses, which is the only psalm we have from Moses, wrote Psalm 90. And uh, John, you read Psalm 90 there, or part of it. He advises to teach us to number our days. Now Moses is not saying that we should count how many days we live. He said, make sure each day what? Counts. You count the days so your days will count. Because <laughs> every morning when I get up, I said, okay, you've given me another day. <laughs> you've given me another day. That's exactly right. And Jesus put it this way in Matthew 6, it's take no thought for tomorrow, for our evil of the day is sufficient today. <laughs> and so, Seek you first the kingdom of God, and then all these things will be added unto you. And so, today is the day for me to serve the Lord. The day is the day for me to be used. If I'm here today, there must be something that the Lord has for me to do today. And he says, Moses said, which I found it always interesting since Moses was 120 years old when he dies. He says, it's come down to the Lord gives a man an average of 70 to 80 years. Now some live longer. I mean, when my wife told me this morning that Elise Burke at, at 98 was out raking leaves. I thought now that's extra strength. <laughs> that's amazing, you know. Uh, and so the days go by swiftly. Uh, Job described it as a uh, weaver shuttle, which is going real fast. But let me tell you a couple things about our lives. Whatever's done for Christ lasts forever. But anything else, Isaiah 65, 17 says, the things of this world shall not be rem remembered, nor shall they ever come to mind. I was once at a table, you know, we had, uh, when I you know, first published some books, I was at a Christian school convention up in Frederick, and I was talking to a guy, a young fella, and he says, well, what's going to happen in heaven when we're, we're, we're crying over our lost love and things like that? And I quoted that verse, and he just looked like a deer in the headlights. He said, it won't be remembered. I said, no one will ever remember they even existed. There's no partying in hell. You're all alone. And so... 
we need to make sure that as we go through here, that we make this day count for eternity. That this will be a day that whatever is accomplished for the Lord will have eternal value and won't be burned up, will come forth as gold and as silver and as precious stones. So James also then goes on and admonishes that we seek the Lord in our plans, what the Lord's will is. In Matthew 26, and by the way, this is, this is a profound, a profound uh, concept that the Lord gives us. He's praying in the garden, sweating as it were great drops of blood. And he says, if it be possible, let this what? Go pass from me. But not my will be done, your will be done. Now listen, Jesus did not want to go to the cross. Not only in his humanity, but he did not want to have to bear the sins of the world. He went there for the joy that was set before him, not the crucifixion, but what the crucifixion would accomplish. It is his sacrifice that opened a door that many people might be saved for eternity. But if he had his preference, <laughs> right, let this cup pass from me. There's a lot of things the Lord calls upon his people to do that if we'd have our druthers, we wouldn't do it. You know, Jonah, <laughs> uh, I'd rather not. Uh, Moses, uh, uh, Lord, send whoever else you want to send, but don't send me. Jeremiah, Oh, oh I'm, too, I'm too young for this work. <laughs> Nothing that the Lord asks us to do is something that our flesh wants to do. But it's something that he wants to accomplish through us. And so, it is, listen, it's not about our will. It's about his. We are stewards you're stewards of your life and you're stewards of your calling. And so when it comes down, the Lord, you notice nowhere in Scripture does it say, okay, um, would you like to do this? <laughs> Moses, how would you like to do this? Well, no, no I'd, I'd rather not. Why? Because he's God. Would you like to? No. Justice, how would you like to spend a day in a pit and then be sold as a slave. Well, I, I, if, if I had my choice, <laughs> I'm sure Daniel would prefer not to make his bed in the lion's den. <laughs> but listen, it is not about us. We're here as his servants. You know, a lot of Christians treat God as a magic genie in the sky where we ask whatever we want and he's just going to provide it for us. No, we're his servants. He's not our servant. You have Jonah arguing with God. Who are you, Jonah? You have Peter in Acts chapter 10 saying, not so, Lord. Who are you talking to? <laughs> I mean, not so. If it's the Lord, it's always, yes, Lord. He's not putting these things up for debate. And so we come to this concept of submission. That's one of the great things about Mary. Mary has been almost deified by the Roman Catholic Church. She was just a humble servant. Let it be done unto your handmaiden, as you have said. In other words, she just, okay, if this is what the Lord wants. The humility of Mary is really astounding. When you have some of the great men of the scriptures arguing with God, Mary saying, well, if, if this is your will, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. 
And so when we, if you get away from the point that it's about you and your comfort and your will, and in fact, it's whatever the Lord wants, that's where you need to be. And so that's what he's talking about. You see, there's a difference between my will and God's will. And they're most often contradictory. We have no control of our lives, the events of our lives, the length of our days, the completion of our plans. That's all in his plan. You know, the psalmist says, man cast a dice, but the results are in the hands of the Lord. <laughs> Now, only by submission to God and his plans can our past number one be certain, number two be productive, and number three, that will be fruitful, and number four, that will be fulfilled. If you're not worried about what you're going to accomplish or what you're going to purchase or what, you know, people are thinking about you, but accomplish well, whatever the Lord is, your anxiety level just went way down. Because all you've done is you do transfer all that to the Lord. Matter of fact, is, let me tell you a secret. There's very little that's up to us. He carries the whole thing. <laughs> your salvation, he carried the whole thing. And when you accomplish the thing, you say, well, I don't know how that I'm going to be able to do this. Well, you're not. But once you get there, and you see what the Lord's doing, you say, wow, this is incredible. And so I don't, so I don't stand there doubting and saying, oh, what about this? Wonder if this happens. That's all in the hands of the Lord. Our only job is to obey. Our only job is to submit. And so only through seeking the Lord and his purposes to fulfill it, are you going to be in a very safe space and you're going to be able to be used to the Lord and going to see the accomplishments the Lord's going to do through you. That's why, and boy, this is a bottom line that James is getting to. We have nothing to boast about. <laughs> we have nothing. Whatever, matter of fact, you know, Paul says, the Lord's the one that gave you whatever you have, your talent, your intellect, you know, your abilities, your opportunities are from the Lord. That really hit me square in the eyes when I went to teach in Moscow and then later on in Minsk. There's a lot of people over there much smarter than me, much more ability. But the Lord didn't place them in America where they had more freedom to accomplish what he's allowed us to do here. Yeah, the grace that God's given us, the opportunities, the, the, the privileges are such that you do not realize what kind of blessing God's poured upon us and on this nation. And so we have that ability. The, the cheering section's coming in. Uh, and so everything we have is from the Lord. Now, I'm going to conclude here. Remember, I've, I've told you over the years, there's three levels of God's will. The imperative will of God, his commandments. The implied will of God, his principles. And the indicated will of God is what he wants you to do. There's also three basic levels for doing. There's every day doing. You know, listen, you know 90% of what the Lord wants you to do. You know he wants you to be in your scriptures, right? You know he wants you to be praying. You know that he wants you to show grace and to show mercy, don't you? You know that you want to, he wants you to uh, be humble and be submissive. You know all that. He knows all that. Be a good steward. You know all that. That's everyday doing. Then this existential doing. Existential. Well, I had to come up with another E. Uh, <laughs> as you exist, as you go through the day, you run across people that 
You didn't know you're going to run across and the Lord says, okay, I want you to encourage this person or I want you to instruct this person or I want you to listen to this person or one thing. You did not know you were going to meet that person. That's existential. As you're going, he comes across. A good example of that, of course, is the Good Samaritan, right? Good Samaritan. He didn't know he was going to run across someone who needed help. But when he did, he was ready and able to meet that need. So you got everyday doing, you got existential doing, you have elective doing. Now what's elective doing? Elective doing is something that God told you to do. Something that said, uh, the Lord says, I want you to do this. He didn't tell everybody else, anybody else to do that, but he tells you to do it. And that's where you got to decide, am I going to submit to that? Am I going to do it? Or am I going to struggle with the Lord? Listen, if you're not doing the everyday doing and the existential doing, you probably won't get down to the elective doing because you're not doing what you're supposed to be in the normal sense. How is he going to select you because you're not ready to be used? But when you come down there and he's choosing you, are you ready to say yes, whatever he's asking you to do, because you realize that your life is not your own, it belongs to him. And so you had these three levels, everyday doing, existential doing, and elective doing. Now, listen, the will of God is mostly very clear. <laughs> you know what he wants you to do in the normal sense. He wants you to be people of the book. He wants you to be people of prayer. He wants you to be people reaching out to other people. You know that. Those who are truly seeking him will come to a point of understanding what God's will is for your life. Whatever that is, he'll make that clear in time. Those who refuse to do God's will or even to seek it, they're not going to find it because they're not looking. And notice what it says here in the scriptures, and this is an important scripture, that those who know to do good and they do not do it, it is what? It's sin. If you're not seeking the Lord's will, it's sin. Because we're not here for us, we're here for him. And so he who knows to do good and does not do it, it's sin. Jonah. Okay, Jonah, why don't you go to Nineveh? Okay, I'm heading to Tarshish. <laughs> That's sin. Now listen, before we go to communion here. Those who are afraid to seek God's will do not love God. Because we're here to serve him. If you really love someone, you will do anything, everything you possibly could for that person, right? If you truly love them, right? If it's about you, you're not doing that. One of the greatest illustrations of that in scriptures is the parable of the talents. The man who was given one talent didn't love his master, he was just afraid of him. He said when he came, he had buried his talent. Talent here we would take as an illustration of what God's given you to use for him. He says, because you, I was afraid of you because you're a man who reaped where you did not sow, that you got product to where you did not invest. And so here's your talent back. In other words, when we stand before the Lord and the Lord says, I gave you all this to use for me, what do you do with it? It says, well, I was afraid of you. I didn't do anything with it. And the Lord says he cast him out in the outer darkness where there's what? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now I know there's a huge debate always down through the ages. Was this guy a, a, a really a false servant and unsaved and cast in the outer darkness? Or is this guy who's just lost all his rewards? You know, I'm not 
I don't think the parable's dealing with that issue, but if you stand before the Lord empty-handed, then your entire Christian life had no value to anyone else, including the Lord. If you love the Lord, you'll serve the Lord. If you're not serving the Lord, you don't love the Lord. Because he who knows what to do and does it not, it's what? It's sin. Let's pray. The gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being here. We pray, Lord, that we will indeed be people who do love you, who do seek to serve you, people who humble ourselves and not get involved in deciding whether we really want to do something or we want to do something else that, that uh, you have not told us to do. Or help us to serve you in such a way that people can know not only that we love Jesus Christ, but that there is benefit to them to being around us because we are serving, that he might be glorified. Lord, as we come before the communion table, I just pray, Lord, that you be with everyone here who loves you and They'll consider not only the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but they'll also consider their relationship with you and what you call them to do. The gracious Heavenly Father, we just ask, Lord, that you bless us this day through Jesus Christ. Gospel outline, a little illustration. And we have a little diagram up here. Three points. This man represents everyone, all of sin, and comes short of the glory of God. Therefore, he cannot enter heaven because it says that evil can't dwell with God. And so this unsaved person ends up in this lake of fire, Revelation 20. But God so loved the world, he gave his own begotten son, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that just spread across there. It's Jesus Christ who is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him. If you never come to Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, today would be a great day to do so. Amen.